Welcome to Smash Your Pieces, a casual walk through the history of the Super Smash Bros. Ultimate roster. My name is Joe. And my name is Matt. And if you're new here, what we are doing on this show is we are playing one game for every character in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate from 1984's Duck Hunt to 2019's Fire Emblem Three Houses. And today's game is a special game. This is not a numbered episode, as you probably noticed in the title of the episode you're currently listening to, because we are not here to talk about a game that is representing any one character. We are instead talking about the game that started it all, because we have finally entered a world where the 1999 Nintendo 64 game Super Smash Bros. exists. So, a bit of a history lesson, I suppose. Um, Originally, uh, Super Smash Bros. was, what was it, like Legend of the Dragon King or something was the title of it? I think so. It was going to be a game with a bunch of original characters. Uh, It was basically going to play exactly the same, but have, you know, original characters in it. I believe it was Sakurai went to... uh, I don't know who he would have gone to at that time. I think it was Miyamoto. Was it Miyamoto? I believe so. It was either that or it was Iwata who was still at HAL at the time, because this, this game was produced by HAL Laboratories, obviously. Um, so was the next game we're going to play, weirdly enough. And, uh, he was like, look, I think this game is going to sell a lot better if we take Nintendo characters and we make a crossover fighter with them. Because Sakurai was really big into fighting games. Uh, we talked about that a little bit in the King of Fighters episode, where that game sort of inspired him to make the simplified platform fighter that we know today i think it was iwata that had the idea because if i'm remembering correctly the way that it happened was that they didn't ask permission to use the nintendo characters they just kind of did it and they presented it to miyamoto and showed them a working prototype i think it had mario donkey kong link and samus were the ones that were in it and that was how super smash brothers came to be yeah and now it is one of the biggest most influential crossover things ever. Pretty much, yeah. In video games. It doesn't really get much bigger than Smash Brothers. Which is super weird looking at how small this game was to start. Like, that's that's one of two things that was most jarring for me. Like, obviously, I knew about this. I played this game as a kid all the time. This was one of my favorite games to play as a child. One of the things that is that is funniest to look at now when we are coming from Ultimate with its 80-something characters, and you're like, oh, the first game had, like, 12. It had Luigi, Mario, Donkey Kong, Link, Samus, Captain Falcon, Ness, Yoshi, Fox, Jigglypuff, I'm missing two. Kirby and Pikachu. Kirby and Pikachu. How the fuck did I remember Jigglypuff but not Pikachu? But yeah, that's the, the that's the whole roster, the whole thing, um, and obviously they paid tribute to that in Ultimate, where outside of minus Jigglypuff, Luigi, Ness, and Captain Falcon, who are the four unlockable characters in the original game, that original set of eight characters is the starting roster of Ultimate, which is kind of a a, a very particular choice of like. I think it was a good choice too. I know a lot of people got really frustrated with how long it takes to unlock all the characters, but I think it led, it led to spending a lot more time with each individual character, which Sakurai said that was his specific intention to do so. Uh, and I think it worked because I have played every single character in Ultimate and know how they work. Whereas any other, uh, fighting game, I largely don't play most of the characters. I play one or two that looks really interesting, and then that's about it. Well, unlockable characters are kind of a thing that only Smash does now. For the most part, yeah. Other fighting games kind of have moved away from doing that. Like, the only example I can think of in recent memory is Android 21 and and Dragon Ball. Most fighting games have, like, that one weird character that's unlockable, like Soul Calibur has Inferno. But that that's about it. I don't know. I think in, in Ultimate specifically, man, that's too many fucking characters for me to work through. <laughs> I get the intention, but God, it took so long. But we're not here to talk about Ultimate. The other most jarring thing, and I mentioned this in the stream multiple times, is 
some of the features that in my head are now like quintessentially Smash. Like being able to charge a Smash. Can't do that in 64. They come out immediately. Uh, being able to grab an item while you are moving. You couldn't do that until Brawl, but Brawl was so long ago that I just sort of accept that as that's how Smash works. But no, it didn't in the first two games. And most importantly of all, 64 doesn't have side specials. I'm surprised you forgot about that one. I did not forget about that one, but it's still like, it. it's hard to, I would find myself playing these characters and like, I would go to do Mario's side special or Donkey Kong's side special and then have to remember, like, they don't have that in this game. Because for the most part, outside of his, outside of, well, Mario plays a good amount differently now because of Flood and, and the addition of the side special. But like, Donkey Kong plays exactly the same, just minus a side special. And I mean, and I mean, it's a lot of these characters have carried forward their entire move set more or less unchanged. Mario's animations, I've said this a few times before, are all taken directly from Super Mario 64. And except for like the token, like down B, uh, kind of thing here and there, they all still are. He is still a character based entirely on Super Mario 64. Well, not entirely because Cape is. He's, he's got an amalgamation, but yeah, for the most part, you are, you are right. And like, Donkey Kong is based very heavily on like Donkey Kong Country, though less so because there wasn't a model they could directly pull from for that. Um, Link is until this recent game when he was blatantly based on Breath of the Wild, he was very much Ocarina of Time for like three games. Even when he was reskinned to look Twilight Princess, he still was throwing a boomerang. In fairness, Twilight Princess is kind of just Ocarina of Time reskinned. So I mean, to be fair, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> but like Samus never really got anything that was not blatantly super Metroid stuff like that. Yeah, they, so they added the missile in Melee, and by the way, it's weird that they had the charge shot before the missile, um, but they added that missile, and then they never touched her again. Yeah, it's it's bizarre. But yeah, it's it's that's the part that gets me, is that it's so different and yet so the same for all of those characters. Falcon hasn't been touched, like, at all, except for a few aerials, and his forward smash is less dumb. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love his forward smash in this game, but, like, he doesn't have the knee in this game, for instance. Like, something we consider an iconic part of Super Smash Brothers, and he doesn't have it in this game. It's also weird that he's in this game. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, was F-Zero even a big franchise back at the t- at the time? It only had two games. It had F-Zero on the SNES and F-Zero X on the 64. That was it. I mean, I, in fairness, Star Fox also only had two games. Yeah. Uh, Metroid only had three. Ness only had one, but Ness, I believe the story was he was specifically put in the game because Earthbound 64 was in development at the time. That obviously did not pan out. And even if you take the entire franchise at large, I mean, Mother still only had two games at the time. Yeah, and Ness was only in one of them. Because it only lists one in the uh, thing where you can go look at all the characters, which we... I'm glad we went and read those. That was weird, though. (laughs) <laughs> yeah pokemon only had one like one set of games at the time but they were the most successful games ever pretty much yeah so that made perfect sense it's it's tough to say that pokemon was ever just one generation of games because the anime was there at the same time uh mm-hmm. spinoffs started rolling in pretty much immediately well yeah this this started the trend of like the anime focused one is the one that gets in the game because Jigglypuff. Jigglypuff would not be in this game if she wasn't such a big part of the first series of the anime. Yeah. Bar none, she would not be there. And I mean, like, the Pokemon are so heavily based off of their anime incarnations that four kids is in the credits of this game. Well, also, this is the first game in which they, like, they went out of their way to make sure that the Pokemon didn't sound like they sound in-game. They sound like they're from the anime, and that's something that has continued... For Like, Pikachu has sounded like anime Pikachu in Smash for longer than Pikachu has sounded like that in Pokemon. Yeah. On the whole, 
they sort of have geared towards the whole Pokemon saying their whole name thing, their own name thing, whenever they need to actually be voice acted. But it was a very particular choice at this point because I think this was the first time that a video game appearance of Pokemon had voice acting. Snap and Puzzle League hadn't uh, come out yet, and they sound like they do in the games in stadium in both stadium games. They have yeah. their regular cries. They do not sound like they're from the anime. And even in mainline Pokemon games where they still have like the, the cries, Pikachu is voiced by uh, Iko Aotani. Well, now it is. As of yes, now now it is. Sun and Moon is where that started. I think it was X and Y actually. Was it? It might have been X and Y, but it's a fairly recent change. It took until the 3DS for that to actually happen. Until then, Pikachu just had the same, like, cry that Pikachu has had since Red and Blue. <laughs> yeah, and it took until, it took until, uh, Let's Go on Switch for them to, de- to do it again with Eevee, where Eevee is voiced by Aoyuki. Yeah, and now that still continues in Sword and Shield, if I believe, if I remember correctly. I think so. I'm not totally sure. I don't even remember if Eevee's even in Sword and Shield now that I think about it. Uh, I'm not sure. (laughs) But yeah, so that's a really interesting thing to look at from there. Meanwhile, like, Link's voice acting is very obviously Ocarina of Time style. Pretty sure it's the same dude. Yeah, Link in uh, Smash Brothers is voiced by uh, Nobuyuki Hiyama, just like in Ocarina of Time. Uh, and he is not Link in Ultimate, because the Link in Ultimate not, is not based, like, adult Link from Ocarina of Time is not in Ultimate, but he does voice one of the hero outfits in Ultimate. Oh, right. Yeah, I remember hearing about that when Hero came out. He voices Erdrick, specifically. Yeah, interesting. Obviously, this is also another one of, I think this might be the second official game in which Charles Martinet plays Mario, and the first one where he plays Luigi. Oh, no, 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 there was Mario Mario Kart and Mario Party. Oh, those did come out before this. Oh, man. But uh, Mario 64 was like his fourth role as Mario, I think. And this would have been his third role as Luigi then, because Mario Kart and Mario uh, Party. But, like, this is... The the other fun thing about this is, you mentioned it during the stream, this is really interesting to look back and see that this game came out before Luigi had his own voice. And instead it was just like, what if we took Martinet's voice and we just pitched it up? That's Luigi. So that's an interesting thing, because Luigi did have his own distinct voice acting at that time, and it was not Charles Martinet. What? It was, it was Julian Bartikoff who voiced Luigi in Mario Kart 64, Mario Party 1, and Mario Party 2. What the hell? And then, aside from uh, archive recordings of his voice being used in Super Circuit, he never voiced Luigi again. That's super weird. But yeah, in this in this game, he's just the same exact, like, Mario clips pitched up. Mm-hmm. In fact, Luigi is, in this game, fucking identical to Mario. He is the first clone. Yes. Like, and, and we, we refer to clones that are like relatively changed in a way that makes them basically a different character in Smash. We refer to them as the Ouija-fied because in Melee, the Ouija plays largely the same as Mario, but also like has different traits and then he would get changed slightly over the years. Uh, in this game, he's literally just Mario, but green and slightly taller. Yeah, and, and his fireballs go straight instead of, like, having gravity. And he still, he still has the, uh, critical hit jump punch, which I didn't realize was in this game. I figured that was a melee edition. There's few enough characters in this game that we can actually reasonably go down, like, the entire list of voice acting, by the way, because <laughs> we're already halfway there. Well, this this unfortunately also started the uh, trend of Donkey Kong sounding like a monkey instead of like Donkey Kong. Yes. Well, at the time, he did not have a voice yet. Uh, Donkey Kong 64 was not until a couple years later, I think, right? Uh, Donkey Kong 64 would be a couple years later, yes, but he does have like vocalizations in country that do not sound like the sounds he is making in 64. Yeah. I forget. What does he sound like in like Mario Kart and Mario Party? Right, yeah, he doesn't sound like he does in uh, Smash Brothers, but I don't remember 
it's been so long since I played Donkey Kong in a Mario Party game, and I've basically never played much of Mario Kart 64. Mm-hmm. He has essentially, in Smash, never sounded like Donkey Kong. He's always just sounded like a gorilla, and that's not how he sounds. And that's always been a sticking point for me, and this is where it started. <laughs> This is the only one that has an excuse, too, because, yes, you are right, he didn't really have a voice actor back then. Yeah, uh, but some other voice actors that you have, uh, we still have uh, Kazumi Totaka as Yoshi. Uh, mm-hmm. we, ta- we, men- we brought that up on the Yoshi Story episode. This is, by the way, I assume this is like close to the next one you're going to bring up. This is the first game in which Kirby has a voice. Yes, and the voice a- the voice actress for Kirby is Makiko Omoto. Yeah. Uh, she also performs the voice for Ness. Mm-hmm. And she still does both voices, I believe. Yes, to this day. And this, like, this narrowly beat out Kirby 64 by, like, a year. <laughs> um, yeah. Which would be the first Kirby game in which Kirby had a voice, but this is the first game in which Kirby ever had a voice. Yeah, she's had a couple bit parts uh, in other things. Uh, something that I find very funny is that in Brawl, she voiced, uh, Lynn from Fire Emblem for the assist trophy. And because of how seriously Japan takes their voice actors, she is now the single official voice for Lynn in all things Fire Emblem. <laughs> Good. She would also go on to be Viridi in, uh, in Kid Icarus. But other than that, she hasn't really had a major recurring role. Viridi will never not be Hinden Walch in my mind, which is why I get so sad about the, uh, Palutena's <laughs> guidance well now you can know that she's also kirby i mean that does help at least fox is voiced by uh his actor from star fox 64 uh shinobu satochi his voice acting is exactly the same in japanese and english in this though so uh his his english voice did not record anything for smash 64 mm-hmm. uh captain falcon is voiced by ryo horikawa who you may recognize as vegeta Sure do. Does he continue to voice Falcon, or has he moved on? Yes, he is. He is still Captain Falcon. Well, they're they're using uh, archive recordings of Captain Falcon from Brawl nowadays, or, or maybe from Melee. I think they recorded him for Melee and then never brought him in the booth again. Nice. But they they did bring him back to the booth for Super Smash Brothers for Wii U and 3DS for Dunban from Xenoblade in Shulk's Final Smash. I mean, to be fair, it's not like Falcon ever changed. No. Falcon is one of the least changed characters in all of Smash after Melee. <laughs> Jigglypuff gets its voice from the anime uh, in Japanese. Uh, it's, uh, the actress is uh, Mika Kanai, and in English, it's Rachel Lillis. Um, I believe they just use uh, archive recordings from the anime in both languages, though. Probably. That sounds about right. And then finally, uh, for the voice of the narrator and Master Han... You have Jeff Manning, uh, who is pretty much just a guy who lives in Japan and is capable of doing voiceover in English. It's always the weirdest thing looking at who does the the voiceover for the narration, because we'll talk about it when we get the brawl, but that's the Bill Nye the science guy, dude. Yeah. Like, that's really weird. And then Smash 4 was where they were like, okay, let's get a real voice actor and stick with him. I do like that they did stick with uh, the guy after Smash 4. Xander Mobus does a good job. Yes. And actually, uh, Source Gaming, uh, they have uh, interviews with all four of them. If you're curious about, like, how much they remember about the role, like, how they got the role, that kind of thing. Beautiful. And what they're up to nowadays. So, uh, we talked about the characters a good deal. How do you feel about the stages? Because almost all of these stages are in Ultimate now. I think it's, I think Ultimate's missing two? Oh, it's missing three. So it's missing Planet Zebus. It's missing, I believe, Sector Z, because Corneria and Sector Z are the same fucking stage. Yeah, for that, I don't really count that for that reason, because it's like, what does it matter if it's missing? Well, I guess Sector Z, like, the, the stage is so much bigger than Corneria. Yeah. Uh, and it's missing, uh, the Mario Brothers stage. Isn't it? It's not, a, it's it not an Ultimate. At least I don't think so. I know there is a Mushroom Kingdom 1 stage. Either that or it's the Melee one. It just happens to be with the uh, Smash 64 row. Oh, no, that is. Yeah, that is the uh, 64. Huh. Yeah. Uh, Look, in my defense, there are fucking 100 stages in this game. (laughs) That's fair. 
Um, <laughs> and it's 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 interesting the colorization of that. Uh, in Smash sixty four, it's based off of the color palette in the in Super Mario All Stars. Yeah, and in Ultimate, they made it based off of the original Super Mario Brothers. It is an interesting uh, move. So, favorite stage, least favorite stage. Oh god, I, I think the best stage would have to be, and I feel like we have the same opinion on this, Saffron City. Yes, 100%. It's Saffron City. Uh, Saffron City is the best stage in the game. Uh, I forget, are the Pokemon in the door still there in six, in Ultimate? Yes. Okay, for some reason in my brain, I was like, I remember people being kind of mad that those were gone. The reason you think that is because the first time we saw it was in the middle of the the Invitational Tournament, where we didn't know that the hazard toggle existed yet, and they had hazards turned off. Yeah, right. That one is also another, like, interesting one to note in terms of, like, the anime being the main influencer, because, again, all of those Pokemon use their anime voices. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, that's probably, that was probably like a uh, part of how they decided what Pokemon would appear. Yeah. Which ones can they just use those voices for? Uh, same with the Pokeballs. They all use those as well. Also, Porygon's on that stage. I forget that sometimes. Yeah. Whoops. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Did Pori, was Porygon still on that stage in Ultimate? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Well then. Okay. It, Porygon's the weirdest one because it just comes out and is like, hi ya, and it fucking headbutts you into space. Porygon never really got its chance to shine and codify what it does in the anime. Sure, sure didn't. I, I just think that stage has a great layout. Uh, its hazards are fun and easily avoidable. And it's just a, a good stage altogether. And it's also the, f- the only stage in two entire games that was based on an actual location in Pokemon because Melee just was like, you got a stadium, and then you got a stage where it's a bunch, it's a bunch of balloons mm-hmm. that are shaped like Pokemon. Those, that's your, those are the Pokemon stages. And actually, while I'm while I'm thinking of it, because I'm like looking at pictures right now, I really appreciate how for the stages that Ultimate brought back from '64, it it completely remade their graphics without losing the style of of the of those stages. Yeah, they didn't make them like this is what the stage would look like if we made it today. It's we're going to throw a coat of paint on there, but it's still going to look like a Nintendo 64 stage. Because what's the point otherwise? That is what they did for the Melee stages, because the Melee stages, like, the way that graphics have progressed, uh, they just wouldn't look good at, in, in that fashion of, like, recreating the retro graphics. Because the retro graphics are just, like, slightly worse versions of what we can do nowadays. So for the Melee stages, they did do, what if we made this stage today? Yeah. Least favorite stage. I know mine. For me, it's Planet Zebus. Planet Zebus is pretty bad. It's It's got nothing going on, and it's way too vertical. For me, my least favorite stage is Mario, or is Peach's Castle, or whatever, whatever the fuck they call it. Mushroom Kingdom, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I like that stage a lot in Ultimate, but only because they added in the grabbable ledges. Yeah, it turns out that one change fixed that whole stage. Yeah. And made it not suck anymore. Uh, that, that stage is awful to play in original Smash 64. And it just, I hate, I hate playing on that stage. I hate it. I'm also not a fan of Zebus. I think that, that it's, I agree that it's too vertical. I have never played a match where the, it just didn't end up like, oh, we're going to go hang out at the top because the acid is going to come up here. So there's no reason not to. Yeah, it's not a great stage. And it, it just becomes a King of the Hill match every fucking time. Uh, but other than that, like, uh, I think Congo Jungle is a pretty good stage, all things considered. It's very rem- it's very representative of Donkey Kong Country. Yeah. Uh, Hyrule Castle, I think, has some problems, but I don't hate it. Hyrule Castle's weird, where it's like... There's so few stages like this where it it looks identical to the location in its source material and yet doesn't feel like it's actually from that game at all. Yeah. Because who remembers the top of Hyrule Castle? Nobody, because you don't go up there. 
<laughs> yeah. And it looks exactly the same in Ocarina of Time, by the way. They, like, it's, it's an insanely faithful replication of what the top of Hyrule Castle looks like in Ocarina of Time. And it's something that the average person sees on screen for maybe two seconds. Sector Z is a little too big for my tastes, but also, like, it's nothing offensive. I kind of like how big it is. Like, it's stupid, and that's fun. Uh, Dreamland is, as much as Saffron City is my favorite stage in the game, there's no arguing that Dreamland is not the closest to a perfect stage that this game has. Because mm-hmm. people still play on Dreamland 64 today. <laughs> yeah. Regularly. Uh, it is the stage, I believe, that has, like, lived the longest, especially in the competitive scene, because it is just, its its hazard is, is easily ignorable, while also not being just pointless. Uh, and its stage layout is relatively balanced and good. Yeah, um, I think the blast zones are kind of weird in Melee. Like, they're very big. So, like, the stage itself is big, but the blast zones are very far out there. So, it, it, that makes it, like, materially different from Battlefield in kind, in like, in the kind of way that, like, the average spectator won't notice, but it, it does mean a lot for playing the game competitively. The only Smash game that it's not in is Brawl. And it's a legal stage in every game that it is in. To the point that I think that it's the only legal stage in Smash 64. <laughs> That wouldn't surprise me. I can't imagine any of the others being legal. Is Congo Jungle not legal? No. Oh. Interesting. It's really easy to circle camp with the platforms. Ah. Uh, I think that covers all the stages. I like the Super Mario Brothers stage a lot. I think it's my favorite ones based off of that. I don't like playing on it. It's the only walk-off in the game. Uh, yeah. So I'm not huge on playing with it, but it has working pipes. And I like the pipes working. It gives me joy for some reason. It's it's weird. It feel it feels like I'm doing something wrong every time it happens. Uh so that's like that's something about that is really neat and I don't think any other stage does that. Uh but yeah, that's really it in terms of like classic mode I think is great because it's the only time until ultimate where classic was like a tailored experience. I think I like the style of it in Brawl a lot. Um, because instead of being you fight this character, then this character, it's you fight this franchise, and then this franchise. I don't remember that. We'll have to see when we get there. But, like, I like it being a tailored experience, because it it just feels neat. It lets them do cool stuff like Metal Mario, or Giant Mm -hmm. Donkey Kong. Then you've got the fighting Polygon team. Which is the best multi-man team in the franchise. The best and stupidest. Actually, no, I think that... I forget about the wireframes every time I think about Melee because they're boring. And... Yeah, I think the wireframes are the worst. The wireframes, I feel like, are an attempt to recreate the fighting polygon team and a failure at it. Uh, because they're they're fun. They're really simple. But they're just... They're kind of a fun idea of, like, let's take these polygons and remove the textures from them and add some rigging from the characters and all the characters are represented. They obviously can't do that anymore because there's too many characters, but yeah, it's just, they're, they're a fun team. Mm -hmm. And by the way, uh, did you know that in Japanese, uh, the fighting polygon team, the fighting wireframes and the fighting alloy team all have the exact same name? No. They are the uh, Nazo Nozako Teki Gundan, which translates to Mysterious Small Fry Enemy Corps. Huh. Oh, the Mii Fighters also have that name. Weird. Yeah, I don't like that it's all Mii's now. That's the saddest part. Yeah. The other thing that I miss that this game has has renewed my missing of it is uh, Break the Targets. I miss Break the Targets so much. Yeah. So this game and Melee are the only two to do, again, custom break the targets maps for every character. Uh, Everybody has their own map. And that obviously ended in Brawl because it became unruly. And as you mentioned on the stream, 
the way they decided to handle it in Brawl, uh, I'd rather not have it at all. And they listened to that. And so with Wii U, it might as well not be a thing. Because it's not. Target Blast sucks. And and then in Ultimate, it's there's nothing. There's no break the targets. It's just gone. I think that the choice to not do it anymore is the correct choice because of development realities. But I miss it a lot. And Board the Platforms just never came back ever. And I really like Board the Platforms as well. Yeah, Board the Platforms should have at least been in Melee. It's it's really a reminder of, like, this is a platform fighter. Like, this this fighter has basically been built to be a platformer where you are beating people up. Uh, and Board the Platforms is like, let's let's really play with that. Let's mess with that. And they do such cool stuff with, with those stages, both Break the Targets and Board the Platforms. Like, Foxes is a rail. It's on rails. That's really cool. Yeah. Or uh, Lynx is explicitly laid out to sort of look like a dungeon as much as it can be and and that kind of thing i really really like it and everybody has their own aesthetics like donkey kong and mario are uh their stages are heavily based on the red girders of donkey kong and then you've got like luigi who is based on the blue bricks of mario brothers and just just all sorts of little details like that that uh, we'll we'll talk more about in Melee, because I think they upped that even more uh, for Melee's Break the Targets courses. Yeah, I think so. But, yeah, it's just, it's a thing that I miss. I really wish that that had come back, and I it doesn't sound like that's in the cards. Even if it was in the cards before, COVID has probably killed it. Um, but I don't think it ever was. I don't think they have any plans to bring back Break the Targets. And if they did, it'd probably be like Brawl, where it's just five courses that everybody can play or some shit like that. And at that mm-hmm. point, I'd rather not have it at all. More or less. It's unfortunate. And that's basically all I have. I guess we can give brief mention to the music, even though it's pretty much all remixes. I do want to say uh this and Melee, which we'll probably talk about it more in Melee, because it's more apparent than it is in this game, I feel like. But uh all of the music was done by one person, which is, again, kind of uh interesting to look back on and think that, oh, that was a thing at some point. Because we're so used to, since Brawl, uh, having hundred, like a hundred composers working yeah. on the soundtrack of a Smash game. And yet these two were all done by one dude named Hirokazu Ando. Uh, and it's... His music has stuck around in Smash since. Well, give me the full, give me the full original sound chat pitch. Tell me about this guy. I mean, he worked for HAL Laboratories. Uh, he did a bunch of Kirby stuff. He was basically brought in because he worked on Kirby. Uh, we've already actually played a game that he did music for, which was Kirby's Adventure. Uh, and we'll be playing another game that he did music for in a couple of games from now being Kirby 64. Nice. And we're, we're playing Kirby Superstar Ultra, which he also did music for. He has done a lot of stuff for HAL, and in fact is still doing stuff for Kirby, because recently he did the music for Kirby, uh, Super Kirby Clash in 2019. Oh, wow. I did not, I did not know that. He is still working on Kirby games. Uh, he is still, he's still in there. He has not done anything new in Smash since, I think he might have done something in Brawl, if I remember correctly. He, has basically been the one whose music has been around in Smash for longer than anybody else. Uh, but I don't feel like there's a lot to say about the music itself outside of this dude was, was good and was handed the keys to a bunch of other songs because for the most part, they're still just, they're remixes of songs, a lot of which we've already talked about. Yeah. Uh, but there are a couple standouts, I think. Uh, like, we have not actually talked about the Super Mario Brothers theme, and he did a pretty cool remix of that.
Yeah, actually, sometimes I forget that it's uh, it's a remix of the original Mario theme, because isn't that song not in Mario 64? Uh, not as far as I'm aware. It is nowhere in that game. That's kind of crazy, because also the Zelda theme was not in Ocarina of Time, and it's the song for Hyrule Castle. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, what? Hmm, I've never thought about that. <laughs> Zebus is based on Super Metroid. Is that song actually in Super Metroid, or is that the song? That's the song from original Metroid, isn't it? Well, I, I mean, in that case, at least, like, Planet Zebus isn't specifically based off of Super Metroid anymore than it is based off the the original. Yeah, I suppose. Even though Samus herself is explicitly based on Super Metroid. I mean, as much as you can be. I I wouldn't say that it's, like, significantly Super Metroid-specific thing. But yeah, for the most part, I think the only song that I really want to give a huge shout-out to is Metacrystal. song's fucking rad yeah it's the the song that plays when you are fighting metal mario and it's super cool smash 64 doesn't have a lot of uh like original music but the stuff that it does have is really good which in addition to metal crystal there's also dual zone which plays on battlefield The only time you ever get to fight on Battlefield is when you're fighting the Fighting Polygon team, so this is really the theme of the Fighting Polygon team. I I like the Final Destination music. I'll I'll I know you said you didn't really like it, but I think it's I think it's good. I think it's the weakest Final Destination music in the franchise. I think I would overall agree with that. I think I like it slightly more than Melee, but not all that much. And then obviously they've kind of been upping the game since Brawl. You know it's a weird song? It's the song that plays on the results screen after you fi- after you fight Master Hand called All Clear. Yeah, it kind of feels like a drunk guy playing a piano <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> it's also got this really ominous tone to it, too. It's like something ha- something has gone wrong. I think I'll also call attention to 
the credits music because I think this is the only Super Smash Brothers game that has its own distinct credits music. Somebody pointed out during the stream, and I think this is a very interesting thing to note, is that every Smash game after this has a main theme, and then they take that leitmotif, and that's the one they use for every original song in the game. So, like, Melee, you have Menu 1, and that's everything. Or, uh, in Brawl, you have the Brawl theme, of which there are 400 remixes of it. Same with uh, 3DS and Wii U. Same with Ultimate, which all of those are are remixes of Lifelight. And 64 doesn't have that. There's no singular leitmotif. They're all just different songs. No, I, th- you're right. I agree with that. But I'm also like, it's also like in future games, there was no specific credits music. It just plays whatever. Like it plays the theme of the character that you played single player as. Yeah, that's that's fair. So this is the only distinct credits music in the franchise, unless you count, like, Life Light for uh, World of Light. I kind of count that, but it's not the same. Or the Brawl main theme for Subspace Emissary. But again, those are just the opening theme again. Yeah. So, like, it's it's very interesting to look back at this game and just be like, well, when the original songs are there, like, they are distinguishable from each other entirely, like... There's no central leitmotif to this game, which is really fucking weird when you look at Smash as it grew. Because Melee has a leitmotif, but it doesn't make huge, massive use of it. Like, Menu 1 you'll find in a good amount of places in Melee, but it's not like to the point of, say, the Brawl theme, where they're all remixes of the Brawl theme. <laughs> And so it just it just built up from there, I guess, if that makes sense. I don't know. It's an interesting soundtrack, but it it's also, I think, the most interesting when compared with what came after it, which I think could be said for pretty much all of Smash 64. Yeah. Smash 64, I don't personally have that much fun going back to play it nowadays. Um, I think that it is largely outclassed by the games that came afterwards. But it's astonishing how much it had going for it from minute one. Yeah. Like I said in the last episode, this was my favorite Smash game until Ultimate. And that was not out of me being like, it's the best Smash game. Uh, Obviously, things that came after it were better. Uh, They were bigger. They were more ambitious. They were stronger games in general. Melee improved on Smash 64 in fucking every way possible. Uh, but I have fun going back to Smash 64. I would say yes, it's still very fun nowadays. A lot of that is nostalgia. This, I, I didn't play a lot of Melee as a kid, I didn't have a GameCube. I've probably played Melee so few times in my life that I could count them on my fingers. I just haven't touched Melee basically ever. So 64 always remained that. And then when Brawl came out and was kind of disappointing, 64 remained in that spot. And I liked Wii U a lot, but I still had more fun playing 64. But now Ultimate is here, and I really, really like playing Ultimate. Like, a lot. So I it has finally dethroned 64 as being my favorite Super Smash Bros. game. It's why we're here. It's why we are here. It's fantastic that it's come so far, frankly. Yeah. And I think that's a good spot to call it good for this episode. It went much longer than I thought it would. I figured we'd go for 
half an hour at most. And I wonder if we're ever going to... It's currently, re- date of recording is June 15th. Are we ever going to learn who the hell this arms character is? <laughs> uh, I Now that you've said that, we are for sure going to know before this episode comes out. <laughs> I know, that's why I said it. Good. I want to know. <laughs> doing God's work. <laughs> I'm doing God's work here. Um, So, we should probably move on to our next game. And that game is representing fighter number Eight, Pikachu. It is the 1999 Nintendo 64 game, Pokemon Snap. So at this point, I think it'd be good to just say as a point of reminder, because we haven't said this since I think episode zero. There's a lot of Pokemon in Smash Brothers. Uh, and Pokemon games are kind of very similar. Yeah, we one of the main questions we're usually asked is... Why are you playing Pokemon Snap for Pikachu and not Pokemon Yellow? Their game's literally called Pikachu Edition. Why aren't you playing that? And there are two reasons for that. One, I don't want to play Gen 1. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Gen 1's bad. I don't have any desire to go play a Gen 1 game. Uh, But two, I don't want to play fucking ten Pokemon games. They're very samey. By the time we hit the third Pokemon game, we will have run out of shit to say. (laughs) Yeah. And people say, like, uh, oh, well, there's so many po- Pokemon, but there's so many Fire Emblem games, you're going to get tired of those, right? It's like, Fire Emblem at least has a distinct story that we can discuss and have, like, different conversations about. How many times, like, if we were playing Yellow for Pikachu, we would literally be talking about the Kanto region games twice. Yeah, pretty much, because what would we play for, for Jigglypuff? We'd fucking play Red and Blue! No, for Jigglypuff, we have Pokemon Conquest. Well, yeah, but, like, what would we, if we were doing all regular Pokemon games? Oh, yeah, yeah. We'd fucking play Red and Blue, and then we'd be playing Yellow, and that would actually, literally, essentially be us playing the same game twice. Pretty much. Uh, And just from the unfortunate uh, way it turned out of us playing games in chronological order, we're not getting to a real Pokemon game for a while. And look, I... Pokemon Crystal is one of my favorite games of all time. I am unbelievably sad that we are This not. turned into a much longer soapbox than I intended. <laughs> well, I am unbelievably sad that we are not playing Pokemon Crystal for this show. But, like, I'm gonna play Pokemon Crystal on my own for when we go to Stadium 2, so it's not really that much of a loss. So, Pokemon Snap. Pokemon Snap. So, this game's weird. This is a rail shooter. It is a rail shooter where you take pictures. Uh, I played this game a bunch as a kid. This is another... In fact, the next three games are games that I played the shit out of as a child. Yeah, so this this game I played a lot as a kid, too. And I discovered that... Because um, I never wanted to make a new save file, because then it would erase all the pictures that I had. So I discovered that I can play the game... I can hit new game, never save my game, and play the entire thing in one sitting. Yeah, by the way, it should be noted, this will be a one-stream game. I, Pretty much. <laughs> there's no... Like, our... Our completion goal, our win condition, is to 100% complete Pokemon Snap. How long to beat says that will take four and a half hours. That is a lie. It will not take us that long. uh, Because we are adults who know how to play video games. Yeah, we're not children. This game is piss easy to 100%. Now, granted... This is not to say that Pokemon Snap is a bad game. Pokemon Snap rules, and I'm looking forward I to replaying it. this game. I haven't played it in years. Where is Pokemon Snap 2, you cowards? Yeah, where's Pokemon Snap 2? People have been asking for it for years. We're never going to get it. Uh, this is also one of the games, um, and it, this this was very influential in setting sort of the identity of Pokemon. Uh, this is one of two games, both of which are on our list of games to play, uh, that is specifically based off of the anime. 100%. It's also the only two games that are specifically based on the anime. Hey You Pikachu. There were three. There we go. But nobody wants to remember Hey You Pikachu exists, because that game sucks. Because you physically can't play it if you don't have the voice of a child. And also, it's not good, even if you do. <laughs> um, yeah, this it's literally just, you go around and take pictures of Pokemon. Imagine pitching this game 
I mean, I imagine the pitch was it's Pokemon, it'll sell. Yeah, that's actually probably the pitch. I'll have to do some research into the origins of this game, because I, I imagine the actual pitching process, though, must have been... This couldn't have started as a Pokemon game, right? I mean, maybe it did. I'm, in fact, I'm pretty sure it started as a nature photography game that got Pokemon tacked onto it, if I remember correctly. But I'll have to do some research before the episode uh, to, to ensure that. But I, I feel like I heard that story at some point. Uh, do not quote me on that yet. Wait until the next episode when I tell you if I'm right or wrong. You'll have to listen to find out or look it up yourself. But I'd prefer if you listen. And yeah, I'm super looking forward to playing this game. And we're finally playing a Pokemon game. It's going to be a good time. I'm so excited. Uh, I haven't bought it yet. I need to go buy it. It's on Wii U Virtual Console. That is how I will be playing it. Uh, which will probably be a disaster. Because Wii U Controller, 64 game. That's not going to stop being a problem until we leave the 64. So I actually, I actually have a suggestion that completely like I, I tried this after we recorded our episode this saved Star Fox 64 on Wii U for me grab your Wii remote and classic controller and play that way uh, is that better yes huh interesting can you do that on Wii U yeah huh I will have to give that a shot I wonder where my classic Wii classic controller is <laughs> I don't actually know. I haven't touched it in years. Because it's a Wii controller. Uh, We're almost done with the 90s. We have this and one other game. That's crazy. That's nuts. You say we're almost done, but the next game is a lengthy one. Well, yeah, but then we're out of the 90s. I know, I'm just saying. That's insane. It's going to take us fucking forever to get out of the 2000s. It's because we're still in the 2000s. Hey... Fuck you, fuck you. Uh, So, yeah, I don't have anything else to say on Pokemon Snap. It's going to be a good time. You should tune in for it. I'll be streaming it at twitch.tv slash Nintendo World Report. I'll be the streamer on the next two games, at least. We don't know who's going to stream Kirby yet. I'm streaming this because Matt just did all of Ocarina. And uh, then the next game is my house. So I will be playing Mm. that game. Um, but, yeah, so look forward to that. Uh, will you be streaming on your personal channel? Probably. Yeah, so that's at twitch.tv slash Grimace the Menace, so you can go check that out. It'll be cool. You can find me on Twitter at Thedabog. You can find Matt on Twitter at Grimace the Menace, but what you really want to go follow is you want to go follow us at Smash Your Pieces, and that's how you can find us on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube. You can also follow our editor peter spasia that's over at pete speak easy on twitter definitely go give him a follow i do another show with him called uh, original sound chat it's pretty good if i must say so myself and uh we are being brought to you by anonymous dinosaur and nintendo world report so yeah with that my name's joe and my name is matt and we will see you next time for our discussion on pokemon snap